really excited to be here with you all, given that you know the October LSAT was today. We have Dean Kristen Mercado from UC Davis School of Law, and we're very excited to field your questions on the LSAT and law school admissions. Uh, Kristen, do you want to just briefly introduce yourself? Uh, sure. So again, I'm Kristen Mercado. I'm the Dean for Admissions and Financial Aid at UC Davis School of Law. Um, I have been the Dean of Admissions for about six years and I've been at Davis for almost nine years. So happy to answer questions about the community as well as our admissions process. Um, and we have, I oversee all parts of the admissions and financial aid process for a JD student body of about 600. So we're on the smaller side for a law school. Um, but I think that makes for our, our uniquely close-knit community. And so happy to talk about that as well as, of course, answer questions about application process more generally. Um, and I'm sure questions about uh, moving into a digital LSAT format because I know that's a big change for test takers. Yeah, it certainly yeah. is. And thank you so much for sharing your time with us today, Kristen. I'm, I really appreciate it as I'm sure all the applicants do as well. And so today being the October LSAT, I heard there were a number of tech issues with tablets not working properly, which of course is normal during this transitional period. I'm wondering if anyone could just share their thoughts in the chat. Did anyone take the LSAT today? Or did anyone take the LSAT back in September? I'm curious if anyone had experience with the digital LSAT. Feel free to just use this chat function on the sidebar and just share your thoughts. I'd love to hear if you've taken the LSAT already or if you're planning to take it in the future, just drop your comments in the chat and as well as any questions you have over the course of this evening and we'll do our best to address them. But we have one person saying they took it both today and back in September. Yeah, so I'm curious what your experience was like with the digital LSAT. I'm curious, did anyone walk out of the LSAT either in September or today feeling that they might want to cancel or they might want to retake? I'm curious if anyone has questions around that. Kristen, I'm wondering, just in your experience, have you, what are, what's your thought on any applicants who took the digital LSAT? Maybe there was a tech issue if they do plan to in fact retake? How might you look at a retake given those circumstances? Sure, so I think generally um, I would, it's much more common for people to retake. So retaking in general is not something that's particularly notable um, in and of itself. Um, it's more notable where someone sees a huge score difference. So with the digital LSAT, I'm definitely expecting to see more people canceling, um, you know, or to see larger score differences, maybe if someone wasn't, you know, particularly comfortable with the digital format and needed sort of a dry run, um, but decided to keep the score. Um, I know also there were problems with um, some of the locations for the September test uh, and July. Obviously, we expect to see a lot of cancels um, with what, you know, LSAC reported generally about the cancellation rate overall is hugely, you know, 50% versus normally it's 5% maybe. Um, so I don't think we will, again, retakes in general don't are a huge kind of flag for us, but I think particularly as these first few test administrations with the digital format happen, um, we'll, we'll definitely be a, a, even more understanding of the idea of um, seeing cancellations or just seeing more retakes in general. Um, I mean, I think if we start seeing three, four times people are taking it in pretty quick succession, um, then that's maybe a little bit more notable. But again, it's it's not, people have been retaking, uh, you know, two or three times. That's become so much more common in the past few years that, you know, a retake in and of itself isn't particularly notable. And we obviously know which test administrations were digital. Um, and so we can, you know, hypothesize that maybe there were technical issues or just a different level of comfort. Um, with the digital format versus um, the written, you know, the, the old school uh, paper, paper format. Sure, sure. No, it's nice to hear that you're aware of this and understanding of it. And one thing you said, Kristen, really stood out to me, which was that a few retakes in quick succession, like on consecutive months or consecutive opportunities, might look less desirable than if someone had the same number of takes spaced out over a longer period of time. Is that is that because you assume that the person with uh, taking it over a longer period is more careful about when they take it and might have prepped more for each attempt? Yeah, I mean, I think especially now that the test dates are so close together, um, it, it's, it's hard to imagine that someone is doing substantially more prep. Um, and so, you know, again, we might, we might think about it as being a potential issue with the tech, um, the new technology, but Generally speaking, when we see that, you know, when we're getting to like the three, four uh, 
stage and the tests are so close together, it's really hard to say that you were really doing something significantly different. And so now I'm wondering, did you prepare? Are you just going to keep trying using the actual test to, to study instead of doing the preparation and then taking it once? Um, so, you know, it, 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 again, it's just more notable when someone takes them and especially now that they're so close together. Um, he takes, you know, that are essentially like a month or a month and a half apart. That's, that's a little bit more, um, more of a question. Um, but I would say, you know, if people had tech issues or there were, you know, something specific to their test center, um, or if they just, you know, addendums are always a way to just give us more information. Uh, and so I would say for folks that have any of those kinds of concerns, if they did retake, you know, if they did July, September, October, um, through no particular lack of preparation, but just for various factors related to the transition, a short addendum just explaining why um, could definitely cure um, any questions we might have would answer those for us rather than us kind of guessing at the reason. You never want to give admissions people the opportunity to guess at the reason for something. So it's always good to just give us the context if you can. Sure. I definitely appreciate that. So you want to hear the reason. You, you don't want to be guessing. So you want a short addendum. Now, how short is short? Because I know a lot of applicants who want to list every detail about what exactly the tech issues were. So yeah. can you, we put a word count on that perhaps? So I would say a short paragraph. I mean, you know, three, four sentences. Again, uh, you know, I always tell applicants, you sign your name as to the veracity of everything in your application. So if you just tell me the facts, that's, that's all I need to know. That's all that addendum should do. I don't need, you know, a ton of explanation or a lot of sort of persuasive writing in there. I just want the facts. And so, um, because that's, that's what, what's relevant, allow us to kind of draw our own conclusions from the additional facts you give us. Um, so I, I like to say, you know, a three or a three or four sentence paragraph is, is sufficient in most cases. Um, and that's, you know, I don't need like copies of, of your SAT score sheet or any of those kinds of things. A quick three, four sentences is, is usually more than sufficient to give us the context we need for, um, for LSAT issues. Right, right. Thank you for that. And I would imagine that also it's more to the applicant's benefit to spend a larger percentage of the application focusing on positives, good yeah. things about themselves, not the story of every LSAT trial and tribulation they had over their three to four takes. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Now, what about cancellations. It's always a big question. And part of me feels like cancellations are almost a relic of back, back pre-2006 when law schools were averaging scores as opposed to taking the highest. Now, of course, cancellations may have a role if something goes terribly, terribly wrong. But I'm of the opinion that cancellations are to be reserved for those rare cases when you know for a fact something was awful as opposed to having a vague sense of unease walking out of the test center. So with that said, how do you look at cancellations? Uh, again, it's, it's like a lot of things. When we see multiple instances, that's more when flags start to, to arise for us. Um, that someone has one cancellation is, is not a huge deal um, because we do know sometimes those life events happen. You, you know, thought you were over that cold or the flu and really you weren't and you know for sure you didn't, you know, you didn't even get to the end of multiple sections. So you know your score is not going to be um, where it is, you know, where a uh, reflective of what you really could do. So, um, but I, I also agree. I think most of the time you should, a cancellation is just not worth it um, in part because we're not using average scores internally for our review process, but also because you put a lot of energy into it. You pay a lot of money to take the LSAT um, unless you're really certain that something, you know, severely inhibited your performance. You might as well go ahead and see what that score was to see how you know see what how you performed because everyone feels everyone doubts how well they did after the test right everyone's convinced they were terrible um, and has that instant inclination to cancel um, and I think you know you might as well use it as a point to kind of see how you did even if you know you didn't perform optimally okay at least you know here's where I'm where I'm actually testing under real life test conditions and you can kind of tweak your your preparation from there. Um, but I think unless you have a, a very sure sense that something went wrong that day, um, you might as well go ahead and keep the score. Um, we're going to use the high score, even though we might see a score that's, you know, not great. 
Um, so I, I, I like to, I would agree, I like to reserve the cancellation for extreme circumstances rather than kind of, um, you know, just to be extremely risk averse um, with having a score that's, you know, maybe not exactly what you wanted. Right, right. Thank you for confirming that. And everyone, listen up. She said they only take the highest score. People are yeah. always asking about that. A lot of outdated information and mythology around that. So thank you again for <laughs> emphasizing and clarifying that. Now, one question I get a lot about now is the writing sample, because the writing sample has gone digital. Applicants can type it on the computer. In fact, they have to. And they have up to one year to complete it. And I'm guessing that maybe you're more likely to look at it now because it's typed. What are your, how are you handling that this year? Um, so it, it's, we're still kind of figuring that out. And, um, you know, I'm of the mindset that you need to be trying to compare apples to apples. And for folks that are, have taken it, you know, within the last calendar year, some people are going to have a handwritten writing sample that um, is extremely difficult to read. I mean, I can hardly read the majority of them. I would say like one out of every 10 or so maybe <laughs> i can discern some of the some of the writing it's just a, it's a horrible you know it looks like a it's been photocopied four times it's it's not high quality and so I, even though we can read the new digital ones because they're just you know they're typewritten um, i don't know that we'll put start putting a huge amount of emphasis or spending a lot of time on them because for some people we wouldn't be able to to compare that right um, and even, you know, it's not scored, so, you know, it's not affecting the score whether you took it digitally or not, but it is, I, I don't want to put too much weight on it, given that for some people I wouldn't have that data point. Um, that being said, you know, I don't know exactly how many people in our applicant pool are going to have, you know, have taken the test recently, and so we'll see, you know, maybe we'll see a lot of digital test takers, and so most of applicants will have um, a type statement, a typed uh, writing sample versus a handwritten one. But at this point, um, given that it's a fairly recent change, I just think that we probably still won't spend a huge amount of time on those. Um, it, again, we kind of check to make sure you actually put a real answer. Um, but as far as kind of really looking at in depth at the content and um, uh, and sort of the substance of your analysis, it's still never going to be for us anyway, I just don't think it'll be a huge piece because it's hard to compare right now. And I feel like it might disadvantage people who took it in the past when, you know, they wrote by hand and now we can't read it. Um, but I will say people still need to take it seriously. <laughs> Please take the writing sample seriously. Um, you know, do it promptly after you take the test. Um, you know, we don't want to blow it off and just assume no one looks at it. But um, I think right now we're kind of in a transition phase as far as how much that ends up weighing into the overall evaluation. Wow, that is, that is, I'm blown away by that. That's actually remarkably fair of you, that you <laughs> might not look too closely at the digital ones this year because you can't compare them equitably with the ones that were handwritten. But for those who are applying next cycle or the following cycle, when there's been more time for a greater percentage of applicants to have done it digitally, then a larger percentage of your applications that you receive will be typed instead. Yeah, I mean, that's what I'm expecting. Um, I mean, most people take, their LSAT is taken within a year of them applying. Um, you know, sometimes people will have another score that's a bit older, um, but, you know, for purposes of kind of trying to compare writing samples across applicants, it doesn't matter if you also have a handwritten one. If you have one that's digital, I can look at it the same way. Um, it, you know, the writing sample has always been one of those things where um, I think each person that reads, maybe has a different um, a different value that they place on it. Um, as far as the guidance that I give our admissions committee and as far as how I read applications and my team, we really kind of look to see that someone did take it seriously and wrote a real answer. Um, but generally we're not gonna put a whole lot of weight. It's a time, time sensitive um, writing uh, opportunity and not everyone you know, not everyone performs well in that timed period. Um, and writing is such a specific and important skill for law school that that you would normally not do under time conditions, right? So I, I kind of don't ever, I don't think it's the most valuable piece of the, you know, of the LSAT overall and as well as the application because it's just not, it's not gonna really translate to a lot of scenarios um, in law school and definitely not in the practice of law. There's very few times where, you know, 
you have 60 minutes to 35 minutes to write, you know, write a motion. I mean, you're just, it's just not that common. So um, some people who are sensitive to the timing, I feel like that kind of negatively I mean, puts them at a disadvantage um, versus people that just write quickly. I mean, you might write equally well um, without a time restriction. So I, I, the writing sample has its pros and cons like many things with the LSAT, but because of that, I, tr I don't place a huge amount of emphasis on it. Um, and that's kind of the guidance I give my committee, uh, generally speaking, so. Well, thank you for that. You're starting to remind me of the Malcolm Gladwell LSAT yeah. podcast about timing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's exactly what it is, so. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's kind of funny that it actually relates to a question we got in the chat here from Robert asking about the relevance of LSAT to the LSAT to success in law school. Mm -hmm. So I mean, I have my opinions on it. It has demonstrated correlation with first year law school grades, but I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit to why the LSAT is used in the admissions process and how you see it relating to your applicants and your accepted students. Yeah. So, I mean, exactly what you said. It's, it's a test that's meant to measure, you know, uh, to predict performance in the first year of law school. It's, you know, we heavily weigh GPA, you know, academic performance GPA, along with the LSAT. Um, we don't ever, you know, kind of if you have an amazing LSAT score, it is never the case that someone's academic credentials don't matter. Um, that's never going to be enough because what we see is that both, item, both numbers matter in how someone performs in our program. Um, the other thing that we see for our students is that it's not predictive beyond the first year, and it's not predictive when it comes to things like passing the bar. Um, so we see students that, um, that you know, perhaps they were never really strong GPA performers um, over all three years of law school, but they take part in this after the bar exam support we offer, and they pass the bar, and they're great lawyers. Some people just are not, their brains don't work the way law school exams are structured, um, but they're amazing lawyers. There's a lot of skills that aren't tested on the LSAT that aren't even tested in law school. Um, so I think you have to be very cautious about how much weight you give the LSAT in the application process um, because we do know students are successful in law school in lots of other activities and things that do make them great lawyers when they come out. And so I think you know it really has to be in context. Um, but it does. I think the idea is that when everybody goes to different schools and different majors and different times and different experience levels, the LSAT is, I guess the idea would be sort of that it's the best thing we have as an objective tool that's constant across everyone. Um, it's not a perfect test. Like most standardized tests, there, there are flaws to the design, right? Um, we see groups of test takers perform differently based on variables where we really, that's that's not what we, <laughs> how we want to distinguish test scores, um, but it is the best thing we have right now to be able to make kind of an apples to apples comparison um, across all applicants. And so that's why we still use it. Um, but I think it really has to be, it can never be viewed in isolation as either fatal to an applicant or, you know, this is a slam dunk just because they have a score that's, you know, a 178. Like it just, you can never look at it in isolation. Um, so that's, that's kind of how I, how I try to think of the LSAT in its place in the application review, but then also in just in thinking about what makes for a good law student overall, what makes for a great lawyer. Um, it's, the LSAT just isn't designed to do that. So I think you have to be really careful about using it um, really broadly. Correct. No, thank you for sharing that. I agree with everything you said pretty much. I think that it's demonstrated correlation with first year law school grades and not too much beyond that, but success in the first year of law school is actually pretty important because if you yes. can't make it in 1L, then you don't get to continue forward and there's scholarship money and other things riding on that as well. And so, yeah, it's that objective criteria, but it's to be used in conjunction with others, which brings up that whole idea of holistic review. So I'm wondering if you could share a little bit more about some of the other factors you consider in applications such as GPA, personal statement, and so on. Yeah, so we actually put a lot of um, time into evaluating uh, applicants' academic careers. So not just their numerical GPA, their cumulative GPA over their you know, entire college experience, but really spend time looking at the transcript. What courses did someone choose? Did you see courses that were you know, high-level classes, really challenging courses within your discipline? Um, are you an intellectually curious student? Did you take some things that were maybe not a natural, easy fit for you? 
um, and you sort of stretched because that's something that's you know you see as a valuable part of an education. Um, one of the things that I always like to say to applicants is law is one of those fields where you know it touches every part of society. And as a lawyer, sometimes you will have a case or a matter come up that involves an issue or a subject of which you have no knowledge, right? And you have to kind of get yourself up to speed. So that kind of mental agility that I think um, is a really, really an asset for lawyers, I think you can see a little bit of that in how someone approached their educational path before law school, right? So did you kind of stretch and try different things and really the idea of learning um, outside of what might be your typical academic comfort zone is important. Um, grade trends are also something, you know, a student might have the same numerical cumulative GPA, but be um, as, you know, another applicant, but maybe they had a really bad first year, but they were such a strong student the remainder of their career. They're not the same student as someone who kind of performed at a lesser level, but was consistent. Um, I'd rather have the person who can demonstrate they can do stronger academic work over a longer, you know, over a period of time. Um, same thing with letters of recommendation. I mean, if they're academic letters, they can provide context into um, the student who is, get, you know, gets a 4.0, but maybe didn't really kind of push themselves. And a student who maybe their GPA is a little bit lower, but their recommenders can tell me, they really chose a challenging topic or they did extra research or they tried a novel approach to you know their statistical analysis and their thesis and it didn't pan out exactly the way they hoped but they really pushed themselves um, so those are things that i think are really important to us um, i would say when it comes to the other pieces of the application so personal statement is is really critical obviously it's it's a piece of we were looking at for technical writing skills um, you have endless amounts of time to work on your personal statement. So when it comes to technical skills, it really, there really should be very few, and any mistakes that you have should be relatively minor. Um, because we, law school is not the time to learn technical writing skills. The assumption is you have those down before you come in. You learn legal writing, not um, you know writing in general. So I think we want to see those strong fundamental technical skills, but. The other piece for us is fit. We're a small law school, we're 600 students total. Um, so you, everybody kind of knows everyone. Um, it's a very dynamic student body. They tend to get involved in lots of things. So for us, being able to identify an applicant who is eager to kind of engage in their community, whatever that might be, maybe it's their school community, maybe it's, you know, maybe they're really involved in their home community, whatever it might be that tells us that that might be a student that's a better fit for our program um, and a better fit for our community and those are things that are just as important to us as the academic credentials um, i always tell applicants that you want your application to kind of make sense and you know provide a cohesive picture of you as a person um, and so all the pieces should kind of make sense once you put them together um, so i can't ever just look at one piece um, i need to look at them all together um, and I think we really work hard in our process the way it's structured, you know, seven, eight people look at an application before there's a final decision. There are faculty, there are third year law students, there are us in admissions. So I think we structure our process to make sure we're actually holding ourselves accountable to the standard when we say, yes, we use holistic review. Um, so we try to do that both structurally as well as, you know, kind of as our philosophical approach. To reading things um so nothing nothing no piece in isolation for sure well that was really interesting i'm interested to hear more about how students get involved in the community could you share a little bit more about the types of extracurricular activities that uc davis students per participate in yeah so our students it is uh, very common for students to be involved in two three four things outside of classes um, it's pretty common for people to do kind of one sort of academic, more academic activity like a journal or um, one of our competitions teams. We have a moot court, a mock trial, a negotiation team. Um, they're typically, you know, might be involved in a student organization that's focused on uh, kind of the area of law they intend to practice. So there's a student org for people who want to practice intellectual property, people want to practice criminal law. So it's common for a student to be involved in something like that. And then we have affinity groups, so you know groups that are um, are focused on shared racial ethnic background. Um, we have a student organization that is for students who are the first in their family to graduate from college. Um, so the kind of that 
I have, a, I have something in common with you and our personal, you know, personal background. Um, and they do all of those things as well as be students. Um, and I would say the only thing I always worry about with some of them is that they commit to too many things, but they, I think they, our students seem to really find that valuable and like the idea of learning in lots of different settings from lots of different people and, and not just, you know, not just the classroom experience. I can learn from my moot court teammate who is, you know, I'm 22 and I'm coming straight from undergrad. He's 45, he's had a career, has three kids, right? We both like doing moot court, uh, but we're hugely different and we can learn from each other. So I think students really kind of value that that as both as something they just enjoy, um, I think that makes them happier, <laughs> um, but I also think they appreciate it as a learning opportunity. Um, so when we can see that in an applicant, that tells us they would probably be a good fit for us. Right, right, thank you for that. I wanna circle back to something you said earlier, Kristen, about students who, a student who has an upward trend in GPA is looked upon perhaps more favorably than one who has a consistent GPA, even if the averages might be the same because the low to high shows the potential and shows a certain progression. And I've had a number of students in this situation, oftentimes who they maybe goofed off a little bit freshman year or they didn't fully adjust to undergrad freshman year and they're concerned about it and they wonder how it'll be looked upon. And so I'm guessing you would say, well, if they have the upward trend, that'll be looked upon more favorably. Do they actually need to write an addendum about that freshman year if there's nothing particularly noteworthy about it? Um, I would say no. <laughs> um, you know, sometimes people will and they'll say I wasn't particularly focused or I embraced my freedom a little too much. Um, and that's fine. I mean, I, if it gives an applicant some sense of security to know that they explicitly said it and expressed some regret, um, that's fine. But it, I really don't think it's necessary if there was, you know, if there was an illness or, you know, some extraordinary circumstance that really made it impossible for them to perform at a peak level um, because and especially if it's right like the beginning of college because that that happens for a lot of people you know I'm really homesick or I did enjoy being without curfew <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and so we know those things there's kind of a collection of things that happen um, and it's not that it's not that uncommon <laughs> uh, so we we don't I don't think an addendum in those cases is, is typically warranted um, that being said I'm not going to penalize someone if they want to just, you know, on the record, be sure that they said, I goofed around and I'm really sorry about it. Um, you know, if it makes you feel kind of better <laughs> to have put it out there, that's fine too. But right. keep it short, just a couple sentences. <laughs> <laughs> and there's not going to be any room for goofing around 1L. No, <laughs> no. You got to get in gear right away. <laughs> right, right. Now, I also get a lot of questions and we have one or two of those in the chat as well about low GPAs in general, period. So if someone has a low GPA for any reason, either they goofed off or had personal issues or they took tough classes. And I know obviously a, a, a low GPA in something hard sciences might be more understandable than a low GPA in a commonly grade inflated major. But regardless yeah. numbers and numbers, what do you say to those applicants other than of course, get a high LSAT score? <laughs> Right, that would be the easiest. Uh, well, that's a relative term, I guess. The LSAT, getting a high score on the LSAT, I would not, I should never call that easy. Um, but uh, I mean, your number is your number is your number. Um, usually, by the time you apply, your GPA is fixed or basically fixed, right? Um, and so, I think you have to use the other parts of your application to provide us with enough information um, that's tells us, okay, you are going to be ready to do high level work um, and you have the requisite skill set to do it. And for, you know, for, for that applicant, my grades are not the best thing to do. Um, and, and that's not, you know, that happens, that happens a lot, right? Um, we have room in the class for people with less strong um, GPAs and we typically have a really large range from the lowest GPA to the highest GPA in any given one L class. Um, but if you don't provide evidence and information elsewhere in your application through your letters of recommendation, or maybe you've done other things um, that aren't reflected in your grades, like you've you know done like maybe you did an internship or you've worked for a bit after college, um, other things that we can look to to say you have the requisite skills. You know you're going to be able to do high-level uh, analytical thinking. You know how to write. 
um, you can you can handle you know really a rigorous workload. Um, those are things that you know for some people they're just not captured in their grades, um, and it doesn't necessarily have to be for lack of effort. Um, and uh, you know we can we can look to other pieces, but if we don't see those other pieces and we're only left with you know a, a less than stellar academic performance. You know, that's that that is what it is, right? So I think if you're in that situation, you want to think carefully about how you prepare the other pieces of your application and really think about how you're going to demonstrate you have the, the the skills to be you know to do the kind of work that's required in law school. Um, it's not for the faint of heart. So um, and it might be just a question you should ask yourself in general, right? Am I ready for a really rigorous academic experience? This is not. You know, you can't cram for law school exams, you know, you can't just sort of skip class and be okay. <laughs> um, so maybe you just need to also ask yourself if you're at the right path for you. Um, I think there's, you know, kind of a few different things you want to do in approaching it. But you can demonstrate the skills outside of, you know, a transcript. Uh, it's a little bit tougher case to make because, you know, it's going to require, um, um, it's going to require more, you know, it's going to be some requiring some Mexican explanation that you know isn't required with a transcript but you can do it and I do you know see people who do that and they come to law school and they do great um, and they're fine academically so um, we do have experience with that with trying to you know discern who those folks are um, versus someone who you know doesn't have a great academic background and is not really a good fit for for our program um, and the rigor that's that's involved. Yeah, I would imagine that if the numbers aren't telling the full story or the numbers just aren't where you want them to be, then obviously you have to go to those softer parts of the application to make your case. And I'm wondering if there are any ca particular characteristics of standout personal statements you've seen that demonstrated that the applicant had done that soul searching and deep you know, interrogation of, their, of themselves to see if they are in fact ready to take on the challenge that is law school. Yeah, so I mean, there's a couple of things that folks can do. I think if you want to think about the idea of challenge more generally, um, I think if you've got sort of the grit and the persistence and the resilience to tackle challenges generally, that also, even if it's not in an academic context or in a context where it's really easy to kind of see that you did the writing or you did the reading, right? Maybe it's some other life experience, um, that can be helpful. Um, that kind of persistence. You can't, you know, you really have to be resilient when it comes to law school and be willing to kind of be humbled many times um, and bounce back from that and keep going. Um, but I think, you know, obviously things like making sure your statement is really well written. And if part of your academic performance is tied to something else going on in your life, that you have insight on that, you know, that time in your life and that you can demonstrate uh, I value the lessons I've learned from that, but I do, I'm in a different place. I'm a different person. I approach things differently. Um, and you can communicate that through your personal statement. Um, and, you know, obviously talk to your recommenders, be candid with them that your, you know, your grades are maybe not going to be the biggest asset in your application. And they can also speak to those things, um, you know, speak about effort and you know, improvement relative to, you know, point A versus point B. Um, but you know that that's it, it's tricky, right? It's not going to be as easy as as submitting a really nice, clean, um, high GPA. Um, so I recognize that's a challenge, but I've seen I've seen people do that by kind of providing some information about other challenges or things that they've done or other experiences. Sometimes people get great work experience that required them to do um, the type of uh, you know help them develop the same skills they might have developed in college, um, and they just learned through a different in a different setting than school. They learned in the work world and now they're ready for, for law school. They have the skills. Right. Um, I'm but, noticing that trend of that, that common theme running through some of these examples of change over time and growth over time. Or would you say that that's one of the common characteristics of a successful application where the, the applicant can show that vulnerability and that personal growth they've experienced already? Yeah, I mean, I think all of us make mistakes and have things where, you know, it didn't, uh, the outcome wasn't ideal or the path, you know, maybe the outcome was okay, but the path there wasn't ideal. Um, and I don't think there's a, I don't think it's a bad thing to admit, you know, mistakes in the past. If you can say, I, I get that I made a mistake, you know, or I did something in the, you know, in a less than ideal way. 
I understand um, and where I maybe misstepped, um, and I can now take those those experiences and those lessons and approach my future in a different way, a smarter way, um, and can kind of spin it into a positive, um, as opposed to kind of being stuck in that place where you know, oh, I made mistakes, I made mistakes, and I screwed that up, and that's fine. We all we all do that um, at different points in our lives, but if you can kind of get past that and communicate the ways in which you've turned that experience into something that can be more of an asset, um, that's really helpful. And it's again, it's a really helpful skill for a law student, for a lawyer. Um, you know, it's not a it's not an easy path you're about to take, and so um, you know, not being afraid of challenge and being able to tell us about how you can move through it is is always a good asset for an applicant. All right, right. Thank you for that, Kristen. So I want to shift gears here. I don't have a good transition for this, but we have a lot of questions in the chat that are unrelated to what we've been discussing up to this point, and I just want to make sure that we cover them. So let's see, we've got one here from Lynn asking about international applications, which I know are a growing, a growing percentage of applicants now are coming from overseas. So how, are, how is an international applicant's chances affected by being international, if at all? And how would that affect scholarship money? So uh, I think there's, there's sort of two groups of international students. So there's students who are, you know, spent their upbringing, spent their high school years, everything in another country, came to the U.S. for college, um, maybe have gone back to their home country, um, or, you know, if they're still in college, obviously, you know, they're not, they're not planning to do that. And then there are international applicants who are, they've, they grew up in another country, they went to school in another country, um, and, you know, we, they're entirely international, I guess I would say. Um, so for, obviously for applicants who are, um, and the thing that I think that really maybe becomes the focus is if you are a non-native English speaker, right? Um, if you've been educated even just for college in the U.S., one, we can see grades, right? <laughs> but two, we know you've had recent English, you know, immersed in English educational experience. So even though you might be a non-native English speaker, you were able to handle, you know, uh, academic experience in, in English. I frankly have a lot of respect for people who leave their country and go, you know, go to college in another country and where everybody's speaking a different language. I can't imagine, you know, when I was 18 going to China um, and just, you know, that takes a lot of guts. Uh, so I actually have a lot of respect for people who do that. Um, for those who are educated abroad, the trickier piece, right, is we don't have that easy, um, that easy resource of a transcript. And so it does require a little more, um, a little more investigation for us. We're going to look carefully at writing, um, because, you know, if you're a non-native speaker and you weren't educated in a primarily English setting, um, you know, we want to we want to be sure. Um, we want to feel confident that you can handle being in one, and it's going to be a high level academic experience. Um, so, writing, I think, also um, when we're reading letters of recommendation that are academic, um, you know, kind of wanting to see those same characteristics that we look for in someone who's you know been in the U.S. their entire life, was educated in the U.S. Right? So, critical thinking skills, because it's going to be a little bit harder for us to see those on a transcript. Um, depends on the school, right? Um, you know, uh, some some transcripts look a little bit more similar to a U.S. transcript, and so it's a little bit easier for us to evaluate it. Um, so I think we kind of have to look at a few other pieces of of the puzzle. Um, the other thing I would say, sometimes internationally educated students um, sometimes have some work experience. So in that case, I know you've been, you know, if you've been in an English setting. Um, even if you are from another country and you went to college in another country, if you've spent some time in an English setting, in a professional setting in particular, that that's a good, you know, I, could, I can look at that as an asset um, and a piece of information about how your, your preparedness, I guess, for, for law school. Um, yeah, so it's, oh, scholarships. Um, so... It doesn't put folks at a disadvantage in term for our our process um, because we will look at the LSAT. Now they don't have a GPA that is also going to come into play, um, but the scholarships aren't aren't solely driven by LSAT and GPA. So 
Um, but certainly, if as an international applicant, the stronger the LSATs are, the better your shot at merit scholarship. That's just that's true for everyone, but particularly for international students because they don't have a GPA to kind of offset a lower LSAT score. Um, but the other thing that I always kind of have to tell international applicants is, even if we give you a scholarship, you still are going to need to figure out how to fund the rest of it. <laughs> um, even if you get a full tuition scholarship, you still have to have money to live. Um, and loans, federal loans, are you know are not going to be the easy option that they are for other folks. Um, and so you know, I just kind of caution international applicants to be ready for that going into the process and have a game plan for how they're going to fund things um, that doesn't assume the law school is going to cover everything for them because it's just it's not it's not a reality most of the time um, and it doesn't mean there's no resources there are some you know ones out there but it's just not going to be quite as simple so the numbers i would always advise an international applicant to remember there's you know you, your financial picture is going to be um, a bigger, you know, it's going to be a bigger project for you than, um, than just a just getting a scholarship. Right, right, because federal loans aren't available to the same extent. Right, exactly. Yeah. Now, yeah. for international applicants, because their their transcripts are significantly varied depending on yeah. their home country and where they went to school. I know. L what what can you tell us about how LSAC calculates their unique LSAC GPA? Because I understand that can be different from the university's GPA? Yeah, so they don't give us anything that looks like a traditional GPA. Um, what they give us is it's some amount of analysis to give us as best you can kind of a translation for what's a, you know, they give us kind of a very general grade uh, range. So, you know, this is an above average performance at this school, this, this score, because, you know, a lot of times it's a number that doesn't have any, we don't have any sense of whether that's good or bad, right? Um, so they will give us some information, you know, for this school, a GPA that is, you know, this number means, you know, above average, or this means below average. Sometimes we can see um, a class rank, which is, um, can be helpful. Um, trying to think of other things. Um, you know, we will, if you were, if you're a kind of a total international student, so, you know, you are from another country, went to school in another country, um, a TOEFL score, else also gives us you know that's part of the the cast report that we get it has the TOEFL information so um, that's also something that you know gives us a sense of the level of um, readiness for an all English education um, but the, there's not a huge amount of I would say numerical information that we get about the transcripts so we you know we can see sometimes the course selections depending on um, if they're also in English. <laughs> um, but the best we can do in terms of having an understanding of a numerical GPA is what LSAT gives us. And they're pretty broad, pretty broad categories. Like it's very common to see above average, you know, average, below average, poor, um, that kind of information. Um, you know, they'll try to do something so it looks like a scale of zero to 100. And that's a little more familiar for us. <laughs> Um, but, but that's, it's not a lot of numerical information. I, it is, it is challenging to figure out how to, how to use those, um, when you're not able to understand everything that's, that's in them. Um, but they give us a little bit. <laughs> right. So I'm gathering that in a lot of cases though, it can be fairly ambiguous to interpret just because there are so many universities out there in the world with varying degrees of specificity about how they actually evaluate students. And so for that reason, to circle back to what you said earlier, in some cases that means that for international students, because there is no meaningful GPA or difficult to understand GPA, the LSAT score weighs that much more heavily in terms of objective numerical criteria. Yeah, I mean, the, that's just the, the fact of the matter is they're going to only have one, one part of the quantitative profile. Um, so that that is challenging um, and something to, but I think, you know, you know that going in, so you think about how you can demonstrate that qualitatively, um, provide us with the necessary information to kind of get a sense of what, you know, what skill set you're going to bring um, beyond just what we could see reflected in the LSAT. Right, right. Okay, so one more question on international students, and then we'll move on to other topics that are more applicable to everyone. So. Does UC Shona asks, does UC Davis have a maximum number of international students 
you take per year. So is there a certain cutoff or um, what's the word? Like a certain fixed number? Yeah. So we, we don't, residency is not a part, citizenship residency is not a part of the evaluation process at all. Um, and we don't, even though we're a public institution, we and some of our undergraduate um, admissions offices do have caps on residents versus non-residents. We don't have that at the law school. Um, so the number of international students is, it's purely based on the number of qualified applicants we get. Um, there's no quota or cap um, on residents or non-residents um, or international students at all. So uh, it's, we do have the freedom to expand and have, you know, a, a residency range, however, however we like. Thank you for thank you for answering that one. Okay, so we've got a question about undergraduate extracurriculars as part of the application. How much do those matter compared to the numbers, compared to the personal statement? Do you care about extracurriculars? Um, so I would say um, it depends on the extracurricular, and I know that's a horrible answer. Everyone hates that it depends, um, but it, that's honestly the truth. So I would say generally when you're applying to college, a lot of times the number of things you do outside of school is a big deal. Um, for us at the law school level, that's not, that's not really a huge factor. You can do 12 different things if you want, um, but the fact that you do 12 doesn't, doesn't give you an advantage in, in, in our evaluation process. Um, I would say if you are a student that, you know, you don't have to do, any, you know, you're not working as well, you pretty much have the room in your schedule to do something else and you choose not to, um, that's not as impressive to me as a student who maybe picks one or two things that they're really passionate about. Um, and invest some real time in that. It doesn't have to be law related, it doesn't even have to be academic. Um, but just to see, again, because we do have a student body that is very engaged, um, being able to see a student who does incorporate some, um, some activities and some, invest some of their time in something beyond just school or beyond just work, um, I, I think it's more important that it be significant, like, you know, it's, a, it's something you really commit to. Um, maybe it's something you do over most of college, even if that's the only thing you do outside of school, if you've really demonstrated a real commitment to it, that's great. I love to see that. Um, but just joining things for the sake of adding them to your resume is not going to give you any kind of big advantage in the evaluation process. Um, it doesn't really, I don't know, it's hard for me to say what significantly you learned from those things. Um, it's just, you know, it's just sort of filler, honestly. Um, but I think if you're able to find good experiences that really help you grow and learn new things, um, those can be, you know, assets to an application. Um, and I do see people who do that, you know, they take leadership roles in an organization, and those are things that are important. Um, you know, it's an important skill to have in law school. And so extracurriculars can, you know, communicate skills that aren't measured in a, in a GPA or on an LSAT. So, Again, if the idea is to communicate a broad array of skills, extracurriculars are one way to demonstrate that. And I would imagine that, and this is to Veronica's question about standing out, it's not just about doing the extracurricular, rather it's about what you make of it in the application. So for example, if someone highlights an extracurricular in a particular way in their personal statement, can you think of any cases where that might have stood out to you? Um, yeah, I mean, there are some, you know, I've seen some students who are really engaged in maybe a campus organization um, and uh, or a campus activity. You know, sometimes we see students who are involved in like the uh, judicial, the student conduct board or, you know, sort of the judicial um, component of campus um, where they worked with administrators. And it's probably a mixture of people who are involved in that. And it's a really significant experience. I've seen applicants write about that, how it was really um, maybe it even, you know, is the reason why they became interested in law. Um, they learned, they learned how to think about ideas about fairness and, um, you know, they had to think about process and all of these things um, and, you know, have written about it in ways that are really significant and, and resonated with me as a reader. Um, and, and maybe that's the only thing they did outside of class, but it was clearly an influential activity. Um, and I was able to learn something about that applicant by them sharing, you know, some details of what that experience was like for them and, you know, kind of conveying some of the challenges of, you know, the quandary that you might find yourself in ethically. Because um, that's, that's definitely going to happen in law. So, 
uh, I think you can do that in, in, in different in different activities and kind of, again, the idea of I faced the challenge, overcame it, here's what I've learned, here's how I apply it to what's going forward. Right, right. And that's interesting. I can imagine that certainly having that undergraduate experience that is similar to what one roughly similar to what one might do as a lawyer in terms of judging or evaluating and arguing for different sides, that at least shows some exposure to what law might be like, at least a small taste of it. Yeah, definitely. What about what about law firm experience or internships at law firms? We had one question about that. Um, so I think it, it, again, depends on the type of experience. Um, I think for... I wouldn't say having that work experience in and of itself is a huge strategic advantage in the admissions process. But I do think it can be really helpful to you as a person when you're deciding if law is right for you. Now you've been able to see what what one type of lawyer does in one type of setting and, you know, either it's dissuaded you (laughs) from doing that area of law um, or you feel confident, yes, this is definitely what I want to do. So I think it can be personally beneficial, um, but I wouldn't say it's something that you should, you know, necessarily strive to do just for the purposes of giving you an edge in the application process. Um, If you do get the opportunity to do that, um, a lot of times, you know, new college grads will have positions that are very administrative, right? You're a clerk, um, maybe you're a document clerk or, you know, you're going to, you're not going to be doing like high level, um, you know, legal strategy. You're probably not going to be doing like legal research <laughs> even. Um, you're going to be, you know, putting the tab, putting things into tabs and, you, you know, you can do the grunt work. Um, but I think even if that's 95% of what you do, uh, if you as an applicant can kind of share how maybe you found a way to wedge in there a little bit more of a substantive experience. Um, so I've seen applicants sometimes who were, they were basically like document clerks, but they approached one of the lawyers and said, hey, can I come to court with you and observe? Um, and so they were able to include either on their resume or in their statement and say, you know, observed, uh, you know, observed cross-examination or, you know, they were, and that tells me, okay, you sought out, you saw it as a learning experience. Maybe the, you know, the majority of what you did there wasn't thrilling, um, you found a way, you kind of put some effort into finding a way to make it a learning experience nonetheless. So I think it's, pers- you know, as a person, I think it can be helpful in making sure laws are right for you. Um, but I think in terms of a strategic advantage, it's not going to be, it's not going to give you that just because you worked at a law firm. Um, it's, I think it can give you that if you kind of made the most of the experience. Um, that's a way to, to make it really matter. Um, that's just how, how I've seen, how I've seen it work out. Um, and you have to make sure if you did find that opportunity to learn that you communicate it somewhere in your application, uh, cause otherwise we won't know. Um, so make sure if you did get that, you include it on your resume or in your personal statement somewhere. Fantastic. You know, thank you for sharing that, Kristen. I can imagine a lot of people will say, well, I'm not interested in, in doing my own soul searching. I just want to get into law school, but I would really encourage folks to take a step back and make sure that it really is right for you because it is a massive investment of time and energy and money, of course. And so it is worth taking a week or a month or even a year to figure out if this three plus year and hundreds of thousands of dollars in investment is, is the right choice for you. Now, we're coming up on time here, and I want to just take one more question that's somewhat related here before we wrap up. And this question is from Veronica asking about particular areas of law that might be growing in the next five to 10 years or beyond. Are there certain areas that you see current students pursuing at a greater rate or certain areas that you expect to be growing or particular areas that UC Davis has particular standout programs in? Yeah, so I think um, for us as a Northern California law school, um, and then also being a law school that's adjacent to a state capital and a a state legislature that is extremely active and very innovative. um, I mean, California loves to push the limits on new types of legislation. Um, So given those two things, there's a few different areas that I think really, um, really shine for us in terms of a curriculum. And then, and I think also kind of set us up to grow in those areas where I think they are relevant kind of in popping generally across the country. So obviously intellectual property, we're close to Silicon Valley. Um, and so that includes not just, um, you know, thinking about startups and, you know, the next 
Facebook or Google or whatever that might be, there's definitely that aspect of, um, of law, you know, helping those innovators protect their ideas, their technology. Uh, but the other thing that I think is really growing and what I find and see our students really getting excited about is also the, the part of that that goes along with um, sort of what we think of as more traditional, like transactional law, corporate law. Um, the types of those organizations are funded in, in really interesting ways where you need lawyers who are transactional lawyers as much as you need people who are intellectual property lawyers or litigation people who are going to you know go to court when there's a dispute over you know who owns that intellectual property um, and it's really interesting work and it kind of bridges what we think of as more traditional transactional work with the type of you know venture capital um, these startup companies are private companies and you know how are they how are they funding that when they go public what are the what are the legal implications of that so i think that's something where we've started to focus more um, more of our our, particularly our seminars, so our smaller classes um, that tend to be more specific in their scope, kind of you know these niche areas. Um, so we started to kind of incorporate more of that into our intellectual property and our corporate law kind of areas in the curriculum. Um, the other thing that we've really kind of seen grow and and have developed a focus is um, around um, around environmental issues. Um, that's become a really hot topic on a federal level. Um, and California has definitely been one of the states that's been pushing back about changes at that federal level. And so I think being 20 minutes from a state capital, there's really a lot of opportunities to engage in those kinds of policy debates and um, you know think about ideas around federalism. And there's lots of things you could be kind of um, exploring that are really interesting legal concepts. And you know, those are those are ideas where you can actually translate the classroom into real world things that are happening right now and are really relevant. People really care about that. Um, the one area, other area I would say is immigration law is really strong at Davis, and that's obviously a high profile um, issue right now. So we have an amazing immigration clinic. We have tons of courses. Um, and where we are geographically, there's a huge immigrant population. So there's a lot of need for services. Um, and again, because California is a state where, um, you know, it has, as a matter of policy, decided to uh, afford a lot of rights to um, undocumented persons, immigrants. Um, and so, you know, I think it's an interesting space and we have a unique wealth of knowledge um, in terms of, you know, our faculty um, and what we offer in terms of the curriculum to really kind of embrace what's happening in the world in those areas. Um, and so for students that want to do immigration law, they're, they're loving their time at Davis um, and really kind of just kind of hitting lots of different aspects of immigration law um, and doing really interesting, interesting things, you know, in their clinical experience. And then, you know, if they're doing externships out, outside organizations, so really kind of, I think there's, those are a few areas where I see a, a lot happening and where I think um, we're positioned to continue to be you know at the forefront in terms of you know here's a school that's really tackling these things and really prepping our students to be able to pursue these areas um, of law after they leave us. It certainly sounds like it I mean if you have tech you have immigration a lot of timely issues a lot of growing areas of law sounds yeah. like you've got some exciting programs at UC Davis. Yeah I think so. Fantastic, Kristen. Well, it's been a pleasure connecting with you. Thank you for sharing your advice with our audience and to everyone joining tonight. Thank you for joining and asking such great questions. I'm sorry that we couldn't get to all of them, but please feel free to reach out to either myself or Kristen as appropriate. We'll be happy to do our best to address your questions. And Kristen, what's the best way for applicants to get in touch with you or others in the admission office with more general questions? Uh, so our email is, is a great way, our general email, which is admissions, plural, <laughs> at law.ucdavis.edu. Um, and you can direct it, use that email address to direct a question to me and they'll just forward it to me. Um, but uh, that's the best way to get, get any of your questions answered. It'll get filtered to whoever's the person in the office with the expertise to best answer your question. Um, and we're really happy to have questions. It's a big it's a big uh, process and I know it can feel very overwhelming. So anything we can do to help make it a little more transparent and a little less overwhelming, um, we're, really, we're really happy to do that. And I know sometimes that really needs to happen on an individual basis. So we're happy to do it. Fantastic. Well, Kristen, thank you again for taking the time and everyone, thank you for joining. Please keep in touch and feel free to reach out if you need anything at all. Thanks for tuning into the show. 
Please subscribe if you haven't done so already to be notified of new episodes as I release them. And feel free to reach out if you need anything at all as you move forward with your prep. I'm happy to help however I can. In the meantime, I wish you all the best and take care.